I'm your host, Cameron Tepetabai. I'm joined by Alex Goldberg and Dr. Justin Quinn. I always am to talk about where the Nets are at, where Marcus Smart is at, where Kyrie is at, and really anything you would want out of Celtics Nets. We bring in a friend of the podcast from Nets Daily, Ajay Brown. How you doing, dude? Uh, I, I'm just glad to be back on the live, man. I love being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we have a complicated relationship with Nets fans, but we always enjoy when you come on. And we can start with this. Last time you visited the Celtics Lab podcast, uh, you predicted that the Celtics were going to finish with the three seed, and you talked a big Marcus Smart Defensive Player of the Year game. Uh, you making a lot of money at the casino? What are you doing with all these predictions? <laughs> Man, you know, I just had a feeling Jason Tatum was going to have a jump in his game. And with Jalen Brown back in the lineup after his injury last season, I just figured that the Celtics were going to find a way to figure it out, with, especially with Ime Adoka as their new head coach. And Marcus Smart is playing phenomenal. And the depth and the defense for the Celtics is incredible right now. Anyone else doing okay on preseason predictions? I had Bucks over Suns, which I'm feeling okay about right now. Anyone else predict anything that they want to pat themselves in the back? I had the Celtics as a top three seed in the Eastern Conference, if memory serves me correctly. So I'm feeling okay about that for sure. I also I mean, had um, the Bucks as the as the one or two seed and overwhelming championship favorites, and I feel a little bit less secure about that now for good reasons. Yeah, yeah, I think I had them rated pretty highly as well, and I had the Celtics at fourth, which could have very easily happened, but didn't. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, the news of the day uh, involves hardware and middle fingers. Let's start with the hardware. Marcus Smart is your 2022 Defensive Player of the Year. Yes. He Let's go. earned 257 points, which is tiered by number of votes, to Mikhail Bridges' 202 and Rudy Gobert's 136. We'll, we'll start there. Ajay, well-deserved, or did the people who vote miss the mark? I feel like the voters missed the mark. I mean, Marcus Smart deserves all the credit he deserves right now for winning defensive player of the year. He played phenomenal defensively all season. But when we look at Rudy Gobert and his presence in the interior and the way he's able to anchor the middle, like like no other big man in the league, he doesn't get enough credit in that category because he does it so consistently. And I understand Marcus Smart has a better perimeter presence, but when we just look at the interior, it's the most important uh, stance to have when you're playing defense in the NBA. And Rudy Gobert, to me, got snubbed. All right. Uh, Alex, I know that you have an opinion on this. Oh, I certainly do. And I have to disagree with our esteemed guest here. Uh, Marcus, I I watched a clip yesterday from the uh, Jazz-Mavs game in which uh, Rudy Gobert was praised for erasing a shot block uh, or erasing a shot attempt with a pretty impressive block. And it was a legitimately impressive block. And the tweet that was worded around it was, um, could Marcus Smart do this? And first off, the answer to that question is yes, Marcus Smart can also get chased down blocks and impressive things like that. Secondly, Marcus would not have allowed this person to enter the paint in the first place. So when we talk about Rudy Gobert's incredible shot blocking metrics, and we talk about how his rim protection is so valuable and he does everything that he can to, you know, make this jazz team a really strong defensive team and have that high level of impact, we're forgetting that defense is a two part thing. You need to be able to stop penetration at the perimeter as well as block shots. Marcus Smart has consistently been the best perimeter defender in the game for years now. And it is finally time for him to get the respect that he deserves. Part of defense is not just blocking shots. It's also making sure that shots don't even happen or get attempts in the first place. There is not a good stat to quantify that. And so there is an inherent big man bias in the defensive player of the year race up until now. And I am finally glad to see that that bias is changing and the perimeter guys are being recognized for all of the stuff that they do behind the scenes that doesn't translate onto the stat sheet. If you look at the Celtics defense this year, they're the far and away best defensive team in the league. They have been for a number of months, even before their gigantic win streak. the spear the tip of the spear on that defense has always been marcus smart 
It's not just what he does on the perimeter. It's not just the fact that he can switch one through five. Yes, five. We saw what he did to Nick Claxton. We saw what he did to Kevin Durant. He can switch all five positions. Um, it's that he's also calling out the plays in advance. He's making every single read on the defensive end of the floor. He's getting all of his dudes in the right place at the right time to contest some of the most difficult shots from the highest quality of players in the league. My answer to did Rudy Gobert get snubbed is no, Rudy Gobert did not get snubbed. If Rudy Gobert wanted to win Defensive Player of the Year again, he should try making his entire defense better, which he did not. Marcus mm -hmm. Smart did. He is the Defensive Player of the Year, and that is final. Alex, so one question for you. <laughs> yes. If you take away Marcus Smart from the Celtics and look at their defense, and you take away Rudy Gobert from the Utah Jazz and you look at their defense, which team would be the better defensive team? Well... You know, I think that's a, a fascinating hypothetical. I think there's a lot of different ways you can go with that. Here's what I'll say. If you took Rudy Gobert and replaced him with a league average starting center, I don't know who you want to pick for that award. Let's say, I don't know. I mean, JQ, give me a, give me a league average, perfectly fine starting center. League average starting center. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you Maxi Kleber. There you go. Fine. Maxi Kleber, whatever. You throw him in there, yeah, it's true. The Utah Jazz probably have a really bad defense. They're probably a bottom 20-ish team if they have Maxi Kleber in there. But the counterpoint to that is we actually did see what the Celtics defense looked like when they took away Marcus Smart when he got injured earlier in the season and missed like 15 or so games. And they were not good. They let up gigantic leads over and over and over again. And they ended up with a 16 and 19 record. People were talking about blowing up the team as a result. Marcus Smart came back and they immediately became the best defense in the league again. So to answer your hypothetical, Ajay, I think it's probably fair to say that if you took Rudy Gobert off of the Jazz, the Jazz would be a worse defense relative to uh, their previous expectations than if you took Marcus Smart off the Celtics. But it's not like you can just take Marcus Smart off the Celtics and replace him with a league average defender and expect them, the Celtics to still be an elite de defensive unit. They would not be. We have seen that they are not. Like that's, I, I just, I don't see that as a reason for why uh, Rudy deserves this award over Marcus. Let me just add something to, we also have to pretend that this is, or not pretend that this is an objective award because it's not an objective award. It's narrative driven, there's fatigue. I mean, I think we can all agree that at least part of the reason why Rudy didn't win the award is because he's won it so many times. Also, there is a new narrative building with the recognition of the importance of perimeter defense in the modern NBA. I hate that dog barking in the background, apologies. Uh, if you can't hear him, I swear there's a dog there. Besides, Besides voter fatigue, besides all of that, I think there's just a general problem with quantifying exactly how much perimeter defense is important in the modern NBA. And people are just starting to come around to why it's important and trying to find ways to measure it, trying to find ways to you know, account for when you see a defender in the lane, you just change your mind, do something else entirely. And all of these things coming together, I think, are why we have another perimeter player in Michael Bridges as the second best vote getter and a relatively modest third place showing for Rudy, who I also agree deserves to be in the running. Like he deserved to be a, a finalist, but other forces conspired against him. So that's my take. Yeah, it, it seems to me that a number of things can be true at once that Rudy is the victim of voter fatigue and also the fact that he plays for Utah and smart is a little bit winning a legacy award and was the defensive player of the year in 2022. I think all of those things can be true without it. Um, I don't know. The hot take economy was in full force the past 36 hours and, or however long it's been um, that I will say that the NBA brought uh, Gary Payton to Boston so he could present the award to Marcus smart because he's, now, <clears throat> the first guard to win the award since 1996. Um, and I don't think the league was necessarily pushing that narrative. I think Marcus Smart and his people kind of pushed that narrative and the league picked it up. But um, certainly they were happy to oblige that there is like a bigger story arc here. Anyways, Ajay, I, I 
if Smart didn't win, the homer in me would say, screw that. But I could see the case otherwise. Um, but we're pretty happy on this side of the podcast, I got to tell you. Um, let's go to the other kind of news of the day that Kyrie Irving received a $50,000 fine for some of his, I think, called it middle finger gestures, which I really like that phrasing, um, and some of his profanities aimed at the Boston crowd. Um, first, immediate reactions to that. I mean, I will just add that that's by the book. That's the fine he was supposed to get by the way of NBA rules. Uh, Justin, do I have that wrong? Yeah. I, I don't have wrong. a problem <laughs> with the interactions. They seem to be, uh, shall we say, more hoop than they were in the past. Hopefully they will stay that way. Uh, the $50,000 fine seems appropriate because if you do that, you get fined. He did it. And those are the rules. Uh, I think that it is questionable in some cases, but it was a little egregious on his part. Um, so were some of the comments coming his way. I think they were still within the bounds of fair uh basketball commentary if a little rough but i i think this is again overblown and if anything this is a more healthy kind of embracing of you know foe in and local team uh going at it in a way that you would expect in a playoff environment so for me it's a big nothing burger yeah let me ask you this from your vantage point um and that being the nets vantage point is Kyrie? needing to lead, lean into this idea of being a villain? Um, is he being unfairly criticized by Boston fans? Like, where do you think this goes next? I feel like this goes to a point where Celtics fans will get more and more cruel with the uh, treatment that they're giving Kyrie because at the end of the day, Kyrie Irving left Boston after telling Boston fans that he was staying. And he went to Brooklyn and now he's having this brand new start, but he can't forget about his past because Celtics fans were there when he made that promise that he would stay. So after you break a promise with a franchise like the Celtics and a fan base like the Celtics, you're starting and you're playing with fire. Yeah, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head insofar as that's what Kevin Durant said this, after, <coughs> excuse me, this afternoon, that Boston fans only feel so strongly because they used to feel love towards Kyrie and that that relationship fundamentally changed. And so this is, this is why you have stronger attitude attitudes <coughs> excuse me, towards an ex-girlfriend rather than a one night stand. Right. Um, I think we can all agree. Don't throw water bottles at athletes. Don't yeah. use slurs. Don't use family uh, shenanigans, but if you're stopping on the logo, if you're flipping the fans off, you, you're right in the sweet spot of like the perfect sports villain. Um, my Red Sox fandom was made better because of uh, A-Rod and Derek Jeter. And if they had shied away from that, if there wasn't the whole Pedro calls the Yankees his daddy and then David Ortiz becomes big poppy, if that didn't happen, I mean, a lot of sports mythology just wouldn't exist. So I, I wish Kyrie could understand this relationship a little bit better because it's, it feels a little hot and cold for me. He says, Hey, let's remember the good times. Um, and then is telling fans to do certain things to his body. He's flipping them the bird. I mean, I, do, I don't know what it's like to be a professional athlete. Obviously I don't know what it's like to receive swears after swears after swears. And if someone crossed the line, they cross the line. And I, I respect athletes when they stand up for themselves, but if it's within the realm of, heckles and cheers I think Kyrie's got to take it on a little more I mean talk to your friend Kevin Durant look what he does on Twitter I mean he revels in that well I Kim I do want to push back a little bit on that in the sense that I think Kyrie has actually taken this on um I think primarily he's taken it on both through his kind of you know usual demeanor in the media and just kind of general you know how he wants to approach this but I mean, where we see him really take it on is on the court where he has, you know, exceptional games every time that he's in the garden against Boston. That has proven to be true basically since he left. Kyrie has really played really well uh, against us. And so I think that to that end, Cam, I, to, I kind of agree with your point that's like, as long as it's not beyond the pale, overtly um racist slurs uh or you know threats or uh, attempting to god forbid actually physically harm this guy 
Um, I think that the relationship has actually grown to a somewhat moderately healthier place in that Kyrie is almost leaning into and embracing his role as a kind of villain for Boston fans. Boston fans are giving it to him in turn. And he is at the result is that he's producing some incredibly memorable basketball uh, at a really, really high level. As long as it doesn't go beyond the pale, I have to say I, I'm pretty fine with it. Um, there is another angle to this though, which is that the thing is this, if this were just a beef between Kyrie Irving and Boston fans uh, with no other context than that, then I think this would be kind of less of a thing than it is. But I do think that the media has not done a good job covering this story, frankly, and has done so from a very irresponsible um, vantage point, one that has frankly encouraged some of the worst tendencies of Celtics fans and has encouraged Kyrie to lean into being kind of openly hostile and antagonistic in a way that is only going to rile people up further. Um, and I think that that might be an area that we want to talk about a little bit more, just like, what does it mean to responsibly cover a sports feud like this? Because I think that's a complicated question and I'm not sure that I've seen a particularly good answer yet provided by sports media. I will actually weigh in on that because at Celtics Wire, I have a no Kyrie feud policy unless it's bringing something new, like him getting fined today. Uh, that will be up later in the day. I'm recording it just a little after the news broke that he was going to be fined. And I don't think there's anything wrong with covering aspects of that feud when it is directly relevant to the game and it's affecting the course of a series. But when you start picking at scabs just to get clicks, when you start casting things in the most inflammatory way possible, because you know people are going to get pissed off and read it, then you are doing something that's irresponsible. And it's part of a general trend. I'm not going to go too deep into this because this is an off-season topic, but the ethics of journalism, and particularly sports journalism, it could use a little bit of self-reflection over the, these last couple of years. They've been difficult years. And we can do a better job of doing our job while also providing content to people that is both enjoyable, honest, and you know, true to the profession of journalism. That's all I will say about that. And giving more respect to the athletes that are actually putting on the show for us. Absolutely. I mean, Kyrie is now friends with Jalen Brown, as came out in an article, the great article by Brian, Brian Robb of Mass Live. And he maintains some fairly positive relationship with most of the organization. I can't, you know, obviously speak for everyone, but, you know, I have personally some bones to pick with Kyrie Irving, but that's neither here nor there in my coverage of him as an athlete. Uh, when it is relevant and I have an issue where that the particular bone, we all probably can guess what that is, uh, then, you know, I cover it in the most objective way I can. But for someone who continues to get along with the people he used to be supposedly at odds with, and times were, in the case of Jalen, who has admitted as much, maybe we should be taking some cues from them as well. Not necessarily to, like, make our coverage nice and fuzzy and friendly, but just to make it a little more complex and to reflect the actually existing reality of the dynamic between these people and not make them into cartoonish depictions that will drive our, our, our business. Right. So what do you guys think about uh, Kyrie calling people that people in the media pawns? Because I still remember that. I mean, my perspective is that Kyrie has a lot of thoughts that he hasn't like sat down and put in his head. Um, or, or, or it's in his head he hasn't like put into words really because like Justin to your point like there, there is definitely something about the the storytellers of the game kind of inform how what cues fans and to some extent I'm sure players take um but that the media as pawns doesn't really make any sense I mean uh, it, it's a really lazy take because if they didn't play basketball tomorrow we wouldn't have anything to do so they're, they're fundamentally I mean we're we're pawns to the players more than we are to like USA Today execs or ESPN execs or whatever it is. Um, and it, I, I think it's, it's a little silly because like I said, I think that Kyrie has been a little hot and cold and like what he wants the relationship with Boston to be and with fans to be. Um, if you're the voice for the voiceless, like you kind of have assigned yourself a certain mantle. If you're, 
going to do something cheesy, like stomp on a logo, you're the cheesy sports villain. Like that's just the way it's played. Um, so I think that he maybe misunderstands his relationship and maybe wants those relationships to change. And that's pretty fair. Um, but the extent to which anyone is a pawn that, that feels like galaxy brain. That feels like that, that doesn't really mean anything. I feel like his relationship with the media and the fans is improving overall. I feel like he's getting a little more nuanced with how he interacts with everyone. And again, you mean like the, the flipping people off behind his head? Honestly, yes. <laughs> honestly, yes. <laughs> that is exactly what I mean, because that's just like, it's a, you know, it's borderline for some people, but for me, that's healthy competitive interaction. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So for me saying that rather than, you know, like in his last presser, um, he pushed away from hostility being the characterization. And I really appreciate the reporter who was interviewing uh, both continuing that line of questioning, but reframing it with a different kind of context. But that kind of like self-awareness of how his words can kind of have rippling effects that are not necessarily helpful for him or his teammates, never mind society more generally. Like, I think that's good. And I would like to see more of it. I don't necessarily think that it washes away some of his past missteps. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to be irked about a lot of things with him. But I mean, that's just the nature of being in the public eye and having some controversial opinions that we all need to get better at engaging productively. Honestly, I think I think that's right, JQ. And I think that um, it, it's weird to say this, given the amount of ink and words and time that has been spilled over this subject. But I, I'm thinking about kind of the original response that things are getting better when it comes to Kyrie's relationship uh, to Boston fans and to the media in general. I actually do agree that ultimately that that is, things are kind of trending in the right direction where it's going from like this weird, like kind of baggage laden hostility to more traditional sports beef, which I think is again, totally fine. Um, the, as long as it appears to be, it, it, at least to me, it appears to be the case that the most toxic elements of this story is actually Celtics Twitter versus Nets Twitter, um, which is just full of like outright slander and just like accusations of people being the worst over and over and over again. And honestly, like, while that's never great, that's kind of what Twitter is for to just like slander and say the stupidest things imaginable. So if that's where it is that the most toxic aspects of this beef ultimately live online between Nets Twitter and Celtics Twitter, so be it. I, I'm fine with Kyrie leaning into being a villain. I'm fine with Boston fans booing him in a sports villain style as long as it doesn't cross the very obvious lines of harassment, intimidation, and discrimination. Uh, and as long as, as long as the like most vitriolic, terrible stuff remains online where nobody actually gets hurt, then it is what it is. <laughs> Jack Brown, game one, Celtics win on a buzzer beater from Jason Tatum. What's your immediate reaction? Kevin Durant was sleeping. He was sleeping <laughs> on that last play, and he cost the Nets the game. But I still don't agree with both Claxton and Brown closing out on Marcus Smart. It should have just been Brown because mm -hmm. I would have Marcus Smart take on that three if he really wants to shoot that three. But if not, then you have Claxton in the paint just in case Tatum does, you know, sneak behind Durant, which, you know, it was a play that was all over the place. It should have went down to the wire if I'm – keeping it real because the Nets had their chances of playing better defense down the stretch, but they didn't. So, you know, they gave up some easy buckets and those buckets came back to bite them. Do you think, so uh, Durant when, um, went nine of 24, just one of five from three. Um, do you think he was off or do you think the Celtics were pestering him in a way that kind of knocked him off his game? Uh, I feel like in the first half, he was definitely getting pestered. Mm -hmm. But in the second half, most of his misses were was because of, you know, he was able to get his rhythm in the first half. So it's hard to gain your rhythm in a such a intense game like this. So it was kind of both. If I kind of look at uh, that question a little differently, is there is there any is there any way for the Nets to make life easier for Durant, or he just he needs to deal with that all uh, series long? Uh feel like he will have to deal with this all series long 
And all the Nets can do right now is hope that they can get to the bonus early because the Celtics are willing to foul Durant if necessary so that he won't gain his rhythm. And it's a pretty smart plan if you're trying to stop one of the best scores to ever play the game. So I do think there's something that the Nets can do if they want to free up Kevin Durant a little bit more, which is play more shooting heavy lineups and get ultimately embrace being smaller. The Nets were really struggling the most when Andre Drummond was on the floor with Bruce Brown. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the defense that's being played in that series, first off, um, shout out to Al Horford, who played an absolutely (laughs) awesome game on both ends. But one of the things that Horford was doing a lot of was basically completely shading off of Bruce Brown. He would be in a position to recover if the shot went up. But the Celtics' defensive plan was to make life as difficult as possible for Durant to move around, basically live with Bruce Brown shooting, and completely ignore Andre Drummond uh, on that end. And while the Nets have a big rebounding problem, I think at a certain point with these playoff series, Steve Nash is going to have to pick his poison against an elite defensive team like this. Is he going to want to worry about rebounding? Or is he going to want to open up the floor for KD? If he chooses to worry about rebounding, then I guess it does make sense to keep Andre Drummond on the floor. If you decide to punt on rebounding in favor of opening up the floor for KD, sub in Goran Dragic, put in Nick Claxton for a little bit longer. Now you have a solution where Horford can't sag off on Bruce Brown in the same way that he could sag off or, or can't sag off on Goran Dragic in the same way that he can sag off on Bruce Brown. The Celtics can't just kind of ignore Andre Drummond for the most part on the offensive end. Like if you put Claxton and Dragic in and make those guys the primary fourth and fifth guys on the floor, I think there will be more space for Durant to operate. And I feel like LaMarcus Aldridge should get some more minutes because he will provide floor spacing. He'll give you rebounding. The only thing that would be his downfall was will be him holding defense on the perimeter because the perimeter defense isn't that good. But, hey, I would rather have him inside to help the offense than to get stops because he, I feel like he'll still be willing to get more stops on that end. But he'll get enough stops to help gain like a 10 point lead, perhaps a 15 point lead, maybe even Blake Griffin. They deserve some minutes in this series because Blake Griffin was the starter in this series last year. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting calculus. The Nets probably do need to showcase what they can do on offense a little more, but they have so little give on defense. I mean, if they, the Celtics, 115 is a lot of points to score in a playoff game, but the Celtics had a lot of issues on their own. Um, and I think that the weaknesses on defense weren't fully exploited. Um, so it's an interesting balance that like Steve Nash, I don't know that his answer is we'll talk about Ben Simmons in a moment, but Justin, while we're talking about the stars in the series, you want to talk about Kyrie or you want to talk about the Jays? Talk about the Jays. I feel like Jalen Brown is not getting enough of a attention that he should for what he did particularly in the fourth quarter to keep the Celtics in the game in the first place uh he could definitely have played better over stretches of the game but I think without some of the 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 key plays he made in the fourth quarter we are definitely looking at a Nets win Mm -hmm. besides that uh I kind of also want to talk about Daniel Tice a little bit because Al Horford was not the man for Bruce Brown to be putting uh, in a conversation post game, obviously with that 20 and 15 performance, but he seems to have at least with with regards to Daniel Tice have been proven uh, kind of right. And I'm wondering, was this just like a, you know, break in focus for him? Do do you feel like this is something that's going to continue? Because I'm a little bit concerned. About Tice? Yeah. Uh, I've actually been of the mind that he is not the Tice of old by a pretty considerable margin. Um, and that some of the assumptions about what he can provide have been uh, overblown. He has six fouls to give the war on Tice continues. I mean, he uses his body <laughs> admirably, um, but his shooting, his playmaking um, and his one-on-one defense, I don't think is anything like what we used to see. So there's familiarity there. There's a little bit of a known quantity, but he is not, there's a reason he is the third center in reserve and not the starting center. Um, so I'm not concerned because I'm not concerned about the Nets front line, but 
if the Celtics are to move forward, I think that without, if Rob Williams has come back in time, I think that that's a huge problem. So little deal right now, but ask me again in two weeks. The big thing that concerns me with Tice is that um, Kevin Durant's eyes light up every time yeah. he sees Daniel Tice <laughs> getting switched on to him. Um, and that is a recipe for disaster. So I agree. I think ultimately Tice is going to have to play in this series just because the Celtics simply don't have enough bodies without him. Um, and I think there are times when he can be effective, particularly in bench heavy lineups, whenever Durant is off the floor, that would be a situation where I would make sure to get Daniel Tice some run. Um, but I think on the floor, the lineups that were working best against KD usually featured one of two guys outside of Daniel Tice, along with Horford, Smart, Brown, and Tatum. And that's Derek White, who had himself an interesting game for the first uh, game in this clash, as well as Grant Williams, who, you know, it's interesting. Grant Williams did not score a lot, and his floor spacing that he's that has been much heralded for improving over the course of the season, didn't really show up. The Nets uh, seemed perfectly content to let him shoot. But defensively, I thought I saw some stuff out of Grant Williams that was pretty impressive. And it wasn't even interesting stuff like getting blocks or getting steals or anything that would stow up in the chat in the stat sheet. It's the way that he was just kind of being physical with everybody that he encountered. He wasn't letting dudes get clean cuts off. He was getting in the way. He was putting his body in front of people and forcing them to navigate around him on screens. Grant didn't have a statistically great game against Brooklyn, but I think he did a lot of little things that show some promise in terms of his long-term viability in the series. And if it, push comes to shove in a situation where Tice can't be on the floor because of Kevin Durant and where Derek White uh, continues to provide the Celtics offense with some major challenges. I would not be surprised to see Ime look Grant's way a little bit more in this series. Ajay, you got a star player in mind that you're looking, you're really uh, looking to see what they do in game two? actually concerned to see if Kyrie Irving could replicate this performance again mm -hmm. because I'm not sure if the crowd is giving him the nest the juice to perform like this or if he's just doing this because he knows the Nets need it because if he didn't score 39 points the Nets aren't in this game at all and yeah. they're already down 15 in the third quarter so I'm really trying to see what he's going to do in game two and if he's going to score at least 30 points, because if he does, then the Celtics have their hands full. That said, we established Durant didn't have a great game. So say Durant has a great game and instead of having a supernova game, Kyrie just has a great game too. They both go over 30 and or 32. I don't know that there's enough juice coming from the nets um, because yeah, a 40 point game and Durant still finished with 23 points. That wasn't really enough to overcome even a pretty big collapse by the Celtics. We haven't really established that, but um, from the Celtics side of the equation, that fourth quarter was a little scary. So, yeah, Justin. I was just going to say, there's been a fair amount of discussion going on about how the Celtics can probably make a lot of adjustments to do things better. But I do want to explore the flip side of that coin, that there are also a lot of bad habits that, pop back up that the Celtics could do worse. So that I think is something to be watching to see which version of the Celtics defense in particular, because there were a lot of moments that I felt like the team kind of tried to lean a little bit too much into its offensive identity, which is much more recent and also predicated on their capabilities defensively. So if they come out and they are really, really dedicated to defense and maybe even throwing in some new wrinkles to screw up, Kyrie this time instead of KD, because we all know KD is going to adapt, right? I mean, even if it's not perfectly, even if they continue to bother him, he isn't probably not going to have as bad of a game again, or maybe he will. I don't know, but yeah. what, whatever the case may be, uh, I, I don't think that we should necessarily assume that either of these teams is going to necessarily adjust positively or negatively. There's a lot of room for improvement and devolvement with both teams. And that's often the case with first round playoff series in particular, is that game one often operates as a feel out game for both teams. Um, both teams, I think, can take away a lot in terms of like changing this individual matchup in their favor. 
Um, I think that in particular, one thing that I'm thinking about is that the Celtics um, offense really did not have the same level of rhythm or flow that it was operating with in these previous weeks. Um, the ball movement was a little bit stagnant. As, as you mentioned, Justin, there were times when they fell into some bad habits uh, and they definitely didn't get to the line as much as I thought they were going to get either. Um, but one thing that is working well is that it seems like these guys trust each other a lot more down the stretch of these close games than they did at the beginning of the season, as exemplified by not only the last play, but frankly, a number of the kind of plays before that, in which, for example, um, I can think of the the three that Jalen Brown hit to bring the Celtics within one for that game. That was a hugely important shot, and it was one that only came to into existence because of some really great ball movement and trust by the Celtics. I think that um, there are some definitely some old habits that popped up in ways that could be frightening to a typical Celtics fan, but how they carried themselves in the fourth quarter while they did lose the big lead, which is always troubling to see them retain their composure, even after having lost the big lead and play a tight game down the last four minutes, I thought was a really positive sign for this team and one that I think they can really bank on going forward. All right. Well, let's, let's continue that thread. Uh, let's go around the horn and pick something that either the Nets and or the Celtics ought to be looking to do in the next few games. We're going to assume that Ben Simmons and Rob Williams are off the table for now. We'll get to that to wrap this up, but give me something that either one or both of the teams can improve on and I'll stall. I'll go first so you can have a little more time to think. Um, I was really struck by the Dallas Utah game last night, Jalen Brunson uh, really just going uh, berserk. Uh, but the number of times that he would drive, suck in the Jazz defense, and someone would be open in the corner, it occurs to me that I think the Nets have a lot of opportunity there. So if I'm the Nets, I'm looking to, to use Patty Mills or use Seth Curry or even an off-ball action for Irving and Durant and try to just open the floor up a little bit by using the corners a little more. I think that there's some opportunity there. And not only because those are you know, high percentage threes, but also to the benefit of stretching out Al Horford a little more, stretching out Brent Williams, who seems a little too happy to foul. Um, so if I'm the Nets, I think there's room for opportunity there. And then uh, again, you can do either or, I'm going to do both. If I'm the Celtics, uh, uh, don't even bother with <laughs> dropping a fourth quarter lead. Um, whatever you got to do to make sure that Jason Tatum's mini MVP stretches show up uh, in the fourth quarter, change the way he rests or something like that, because uh, we know that the Celtics team can really pardon the, uh, how intense this is, but like really put your, their foot on your neck. And I think just like re reshuffling the deck a little bit, the timing of that could, could change. Um, so those are my challenges to both the teams. Um, Ajay, you're the guest, you get to go next. One or two things that either of these teams could improve on. I think Jason Tatum has to exploit some particular matchups more. Mm -hmm. Like he needs to use his size more on Bruce Brown. He needs to dribble more on KD because Kevin Durant is struggling to guard him. And I haven't really seen this type of effort from KD before against a star that's younger than him. So if KD steps up, it will be on him. But J Jason Tatum has to exploit matchups more. And for the Nets, they have to get better on the defensive glass. They allowed way too many offensive rebounds, and those offensive rebounds led to second-chance points that won the Celtics this game. Yeah, and, and to that end, a few, they missed a few bunnies. It could have been worse. Yeah. The Celtics did. Whew. Alex? Um, for Brooklyn, it's going to be play more lineups with spacing. I think Goran Dragic really showed me that he was ready for this series in that previous game. And he strikes me as an ideal kind of floor balancing complement with Kyrie in particular. I think the Nets have got to be willing to go small in this series and just live with the results. Um, the lineup that I saw that I thought was the most productive for them is uh, Kyrie Irving, Seth Curry, Goran Dragic, Kevin Durant and Nick Claxton. That lineup is a little bit small for sure. And there's definitely players that the Celtics can exploit defensively on that lineup, but offensively it is almost impossible to guard that unit when everybody is on. Claxton has really evolved as a screener and roller. 
uh, Goran provides that floor spacing that Bruce Brown, I mean, Bruce Brown is shooting well from the corners and I don't want to knock that, but at the same time, it's clear that the Celtics just don't fear him and are totally fine with him chucking away. Goran Dragic can actually do a little bit more with the ball. Once he gets there, he can either shoot or he can put it on the deck and drive. He's still got a pretty solid little floater. He can pass. I think the Nets need to be willing to go small to uh, try and maximize their offense. And if they don't, I think they are not going to be in for a good time this series. And for the Celtics, the point is actually somewhat related. I think that the Celtics could have done a much better job punishing the Nets' smaller units on offense. And I would like them to see the uh, I would like to see them in particular really drive to the rack a little bit more aggressively. I think that Tatum did an okay job. I think Jalen Brown frankly, did a better job, particularly in the fourth quarter, but that's something that the Celtics should really be looking to do. The best path for them to win this series is to really wear Nick Claxton down and cause the dam to break for the Nets defensively. And what that's going to require is testing him over and over and over again in pick and rolls by going to the hoop. So for the Celtics, it's attack the rack first, second, third, over and over again until the dam breaks. I don't have too much to add to what you guys have said. Uh, I do think that the Nets might have found something in their bench that we all didn't really expect to see. And while they're not really going to be able to win the series, if at least one of their, their two stars isn't just like blasting the crap out of the Celtics on a night to night basis, but trusting their bench a little bit more. I think I'm surprised that Goron still has as much left in the tank as he has. Uh, I think that there's something there that they can, they can just get a couple extra points on the board from other locations uh, for the Celtics. I think that it's going to be an issue of mixing up how they approach the defense. Like I alluded to this a little bit before, the defensive identity is absolutely critical in my mind for setting the stage, not only for their success on that end of the floor, uh, but overall, a lot of their offense is tied into it, how they, they set things up to score by getting out in transition. Uh, that kind of stuff, it isn't necessarily the most helpful approach overall in a playoff setting because the game does slow down, but any easy buckets they can make on that end is good. And then defensively, again, what they really need to do is not be super predictable. I mean, yes, I get the urge to go at KD again, and they should to as much as they can, but they do need to also, and I think this is critical, find a way to limit Kyrie more because if not one, then the other, and it was almost too much this last mm -hmm. game. And we don't know if they'll be that lucky again. So, Sure. Well, all of those are... Uh, predicated on the assumption that the personnel stays the same for the next few games or the whole series. So let's close with wondering if, um, if that is going to hold. So Ajay, uh, we saw some video of Simmons shooting. We've heard some coy Steve Nash comments. If you had to make a guess, are we going to see Ben Simmons? And if we are, when are we going to see him? Uh, earlier today, I predicted that he might return in game five, but with him getting cleared for contact practices, and finding out that he played four on four practices of scrimmages yesterday, I see him returning in game three or game four for sure. Wow. Uh, and what do you think that does for the Nets other than, you know, the obvious? Uh, it will limit Jason Tatum in this series. It will also give them another option in this so that can score in double figures uh, offensively. Alex I and Justin. disagree. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> disagree. I disagree. I do think he is going to be back. I don't think, I think game three is a little optimistic. It takes a little bit more time to really ramp up all the way to, to full contact and to be in a, a position in terms of being able to sprint at a level that playoff basketball is going to require. So I think that he is going to return this series, but game four is when I think it's most likely, or maybe game five probably a safer estimate if you really want higher level play out of him. But I think you can get enough out of him in game four that he will be a very helpful defensive piece. I do not think they are going to find a way to fit him into that offense. And I think that even if he did, it's asking way too much of him to just do all of those things out of nowhere after not playing for a year. So I don't think it's impossible. I think next year they're going to be very formidable once they had a chance to integrate him and get him healthy. 
But I think that for now, all they should be looking for and expecting is a big boost defensively, which is in itself something of a nightmare proposition for the Celtics. Right. I mean, remember, he is a former All-Star. So if they do fit him in before game five, he'll be more prepared for a game five because he will shake the rust off. We saw with Steph Curry when he came back from that ankle injury in game one against the Nuggets. He didn't do that much. But then in game two yesterday, that's when you started seeing him shake mm-hmm. off that rust. Did you watch that game? Yeah, I watched both. So yeah. good. That... Yeah, the Warriors are nice. Oh, my God. It, it was like it was 2015 again. It was just like yes. <laughs> unbelievable what the Warriors were doing. Um, right. I'm standing with Bucks Suns, but yeah, this, if, if this version of the Warriors shows up, the Western Conference is screwed. Yeah, they're doomed. <laughs> so fun. Um, Alex, are we going to see Ben Simmons and what does it mean? I sure hope we're going to see Ben Simmons. I really do. Um, I would like, I mean, I think Ben Simmons is probably, if he is going to come back at all, I I imagine it would be maybe game four. I, I would be shocked if they bring Ben Simmons back for a road game. Let's put it that mm-hmm. way. Um, I think game four, maybe even game six, but I'm not really sure. Uh, honestly, I'm a, I'm a little... I kind of think there might be a little bit of smoke and mirrors and gamesmanship here from Steve Nash trying to get Ime Odoka to plan for something that maybe doesn't actually happen. If they do bring Ben Simmons back, uh, I am actually going to be quite pleased as a Celtics fan for a couple of reasons. The first is that that is a guy that you can hack immediately. And boy, do we have a lot of players who are looking to get into this series specifically for one minute to hack Ben Simmons. Mm -hmm. Um, He can completely disrupt the Nets' offensive flow. Everything that was working for them so well with Kyrie and Dragic and Kevin Durant pinging the ball around the arc, getting open backdoor cuts inside, Ben Simmons destroys that because every Celtics defender knows, okay, Ben Simmons is on the court. I don't have to guard that guy. I can sag off. I can double Kevin Durant. I can get in front of Kyrie Irving. I can go make sure that that backdoor cut is taken care of, or I can put another body on Andre Drummond or Nick Claxton. Ben Simmons is not going to make an impact offensively if he cannot make his free throws. So for that end, I'm thrilled. Defensively, I get it. Jace, there's this idea that Ben Simmons is going to come back in and be exactly the same Ben Simmons that he was when he was a defensive player of the year candidate in Philadelphia, that he's going to just lock up Jason Tatum. Folks, Ben Simmons hasn't played in a year and he doesn't know the Brooklyn Nets defensive scheme. He hasn't had time to learn it. Is there so, a Brooklyn Nets defensive scheme? I was going to ask that too. <laughs> so this idea that Ben Simmons is going to just come Sorry, back Johnny. and lock up Jason Tatum, who is, by the way, playing far and away the best basketball of his career, who is clearly a better player than the guy who already has tortured Ben Simmons in multiple playoff series. I'm not buying it. Bring him on. I love it. Bring him back. <laughs> so what are the Celtics going to do if Ben Simmons is, is the ball handler on a half-court set and Kevin Durant is pre- playing as if like he's a catching shooter? With Kyrie Sag as a all the way shooter. back into a drop defense and send two bodies at Kevin Durant. Force Ben Simmons uh, to drive. I don't think that's going to work. I mean, Fine. I, let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the same. It's the same calculus as when you played the Sixers. Is to Alex's point, yeah, you drop or Ben Simmons stands in the dunker spot, and that's fine. Um, I think it becomes incumbent on Kyrie Irving uh, to figure out where he puts himself on the floor because a Ben Simmons coming during pick and roll is an insanely imposing thing to guard, but I do think the Celtics have the personnel for it because they have a lot of switchy length. Um, someone like Kyrie or a healthy Seth Curry could disrupt that, but I, I agree with Alex. Bringing him back in Boston feels with like a disaster waiting to happen. Um, because if this dude gets the yips, that's, I mean, the Nets at the very least need this dude to be tradable, if not playable. And if he shows up in Boston and lays an egg, he goes four, five, six, and 10 of 20 from the free throw line, that's a big problem for the Nets. So I would imagine it's gonna be game four or game six. Um, my guess is we don't see him at all. Uh, I think it would be really surprising to me i think it's i think it's just gamemanship but to that end i also don't think we're going to see robert williams the third uh it's been about three weeks since his injury um even on an optimistic timeline we should probably have to wait another week 
I don't think we see either Ben Simmons or Rob Williams in this series, but because I would like to see both players healthy, I hope I'm wrong. Um, Ajay, do you think we're going to see Robert Williams? And as in, from your Nets perspective, is that a problem for the Nets? Uh, I do think that we're going to see Robert Williams eventually if the series goes to seven or six. Mm-hmm. And that is bad news for the Nets because now they'll the Celtics will have an interior presence. But I don't know if that would be bad news for a player like Kevin Durant who, who can get him on the switch because Kevin Durant will take him out on the perimeter. Kyrie will even take him out on the perimeter. And if Robert Williams is willing to dance the dance out there, then, hey, but I don't think he's capable of doing so. Oh, Jai Rod is a great dancer and one of the best <laughs> switch games in the NBA right now. So I would After say- injury though? Oh, well, that's the we big concern is will his lateral mobility be the same after the injury? If he's um, going to come back and be roughly the same guy that he was prior to the injury, I think that switch is fine. If he's not, then he's definitely more limited and it changes the Celtics defensive scheme for sure. Non-attending uh, Twitter doctors of a medical variety, not my variety, uh, have said that that all should not be affected and that it's really just more of healing the the surgery itself. So that sounds weird to me, but I assume these people know what they're talking about. I assume also that the medical staff with the Celtics knows even better than that. And whatever they decide, I am for. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, Ashai Brown of Nets Daily. The pleasure's always on the side of the screen. Thanks so much for, for coming by. And um, you got a series prediction before you go? I appreciate you guys for having me. As always, I love coming to the Celtics Lab, one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, prediction for the series, next to, Nets in six. Whoa. Nets in six. Ooh. Stellar confidence. Yeah. In six? My <laughs> lord. All right, well, he was yeah. more or less right about Celtics getting the two seed and he talked to big Marcus Smart defensive player of the year candidate to see the beginning of the year. So Nostradamus Brown, I hope you're wrong this time. <laughs> I lost it. I don't mind. I don't <laughs> mind. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for listening. And uh, we will catch you between now and when the series heads to Brooklyn.